All right. Are we ready for the afternoon session? Are we tired? <laughs> Let's wake up, guys. We have the best speaker in the house today, okay? <laughs> there you go. So we're going to go on the session. <laughs> Thanks, we are drowning in the assurance, supply chain security challenges. We are very lucky and fortunate to have Fiona Long, CEO and founder of InfoSec Assure. So thanks very much, Fiona, all yours, okay? Stage is yours. Thank you. So hi everyone, I'm Fiona Long. I'm the CEO and founder of InfoSec Assure. I've been in information security for 25 years. I spent the first 15 working in banking, um, dealing with hoax emails uh, back in the early noughties around then. Um, to developing online banking security for some of the biggest banks in Australia. Uh, so I've got on-ground experience. Um, I was then head of cybercrime at a large data bureau and I've spent a number of years conducting cyber security risk assessments and other types of consulting work for various organisations. My passion is in removing the fear, uncertainty and doubt in our industry. And my mission, my latest mission in the last couple of years was to develop InfoSec Ashore as a platform to really solve the problem of this issue that of there being a myriad of security questionnaires which are drowning our industry. Um, in the last few years, I've helped companies answer, before I built the platform, I've, I've helped companies answer over 30,000 unique security questions and have ne negotiated security clauses in hundreds of supplier agreements. So today we're going to talk about um, supply chain risk management, and in particular, assurance activities. So how we help manage, which is how we help manage some of our risk across our supply chain. Um, we're going to get thinking about how to get appropriate security controls in place, uh, which are pragmatic and practical, and the good, the bad, and the ugly of supplier governance today. This isn't a technical session, although we might have a technical discussion afterwards. Uh, the ideas that I'm going to present today are for you to take, hopefully you'll take some of these back to your workplace. Um, and at the end of the session, I've got some tools that I'm giving away for free if you want um, to have a look into them. So, why does supply chain risk matter? Well, here are some great examples of supply chain incidents over the years which probably most of you are familiar with. So we had a large homeware store uh, where the heating, va um, venting, air conditioning, cooling, HVAC supplier was a victim of spear phishing attack, uh, which got into their POS network and uh, where they had 40 million credit cards stolen. During COVID, there was a number of attempts uh, to steal batch processes and production sequences from a number of pharmaceutical suppliers, assuming those people were wanting to create their own vaccines and make some money off it. Um, and for the Americans in the audience, you'd be more familiar with the um, ransomware attack on a, a local gas company uh, where they had their VPN passwords exposed. And that one was interesting because it wasn't just, there wasn't just a jet fuel shortage or a spike in petrol prices um, and panic buying, uh, but it became a health issue as some worried consumers started filling up plastic bags with petrol. Suppliers are not always victim to, um, are not always um, the victim to external threats though. But they fail to secure their own processes, uh, which can lead to risk for your organisation. So a classic example of that, this is the Superfish software, if any of you remember that. Uh, it was installed by the manufacturer on laptops, which then distributed to many companies. And after around 30,000, those laptops went out uh, the clients reported back to the manufacturer that this particular software was breaking their security controls. So a couple of terms, if you're not familiar with them, because this is a learning session today. Uh, supply chain risk um, is really defined as exposures, threats and vulnerabilities associated with uh, products and services that traverse the supply chain. Where cyber supply chain risks um, they're typically associated with the lack of visibility into the understanding of and the control over many of the processes and decisions involved in the development and acquisition or delivery of technology and products and services. And today's focus is more on the cyber security supply chain risk management part of the equation, which is the process of identifying 
assessing and mitigating risks associated with our friendly suppliers, or not so friendly. Typically, as companies, we go through uh, the same process. Uh, we look at suitable products and services that are going to meet our needs. Uh, we get a contract in place and we implement it into our company. And then once they're onboarded, we will um, implement some governance, hopefully some. So let's start with the engage by part of the equation. So imagine you're looking at um, different products or services. You've requested a non-disclosure agreement um, or a proposal from them. And this is when the first view of risk is presented. So how do we start to um, assess the risk early on? So before you start asking your supplier any questions or reading their detailed proposals, um, we recommend implementing a Know Your Supplier uh, program. In Australia, I think maybe in America too, we have the Know Your Customer program to help with the anti-money laundering. Um, we should probably implement a KYS, Know Your Supplier program, uh, where, you, where we're required to document at a high level each supplier's profile. Uh, so we can make better risk-informed decisions. So some of the key information you should put down in that register and you should know about your suppliers is the business context. So what's the purpose of the system? What part of the business does it support? Does it help you with revenue or operations? And what are the overall cost of this particular supplier to the business? Um, the users, so who's going to use the service or product or service they're providing? Customers, employees themselves, the suppliers? And what type of information they'll have access to? So what's the classification of the data? Is it personal information? Is it regulated, et cetera? Um, the technology context is, context is also important. I mean, with some suppliers, there may not even be a technology context, like a cleaner, for example, apart from them using the swipe cards to get into your building. Um, but maybe they're software, maybe they're managed service providers. Um, also the support model, the location of the service and other stakeholders. So who are the subject matter experts? Um, who are the supplier contacts? Who are the people in the business that have a relationship with the supplier? So by knowing your supplier profile, you can only then really understand the overall risk they pose and make those key decisions around what is the impact of um, a security event to the confidentiality, integrity of your assets um, or the availability of your system. So doing an in-depth risk assessment right now when you've only just learned about the supplier, I think is a bit too early. Um, and it's often not practical, but I have seen it happen in practice. What you're really looking to do at this, at this phase is to put in plan a place for appropriate governance over the lifetime of that supplier, which suits both the type and risk profile of the supplier. So now you understand your supplier, the product's looking good, uh, now it's time to get your high-level contract in place. Now the learnings I'm about to talk about come from real-life examples of those hundreds of contracts I've negotiated in teams with the legal team by my side as a cybersecurity professional. So what should you include and how do you get this, the right security requirements into the contract? Um, your initial understanding and the high-level risk assessment of your supplier will help you to determine what type of security clauses are going to be the most important for you to consider. So here we've provided a model of how to consider what type of clauses should be considered depending on a supplier's profile. So on the left here you see there's a core managed service provider, they're likely to have more access to your important and critical assets and therefore you probably want to have more robust controls in place. Moving to the left you want to include a narrower range of security clauses for those temporary service providers or even software providers so as not to burden the supplier and your governance, internal governance team with control clauses that would mean nothing in practice. Has anyone here actually implemented or seen security controls that have never actually been implemented in a um, supplier agreement but have never been checked? So there's a few. So think about, a, um, a, think about a cleaning company. So if you were to employ a cleaning company, let's say you've got a, uh, you're running a service, provide professional services to um, the military and you've got top secret um, information assets in your office and you're wanting to employ a cleaning company, they've got 100 employees, but you've designated 10 particular people to attend your offices in, on a rotational basis. 
So if you were to push out background screening requirements for all of the company at a high level, that would be impractical and commercially hard for that cleaner to start to give you the prices you might want. So what you really want is for those 10 people. You want to focus down on exactly what are the controls and where are they, they likely to um, have the most benefit for you. So at the presentation, end of, um, presentation today, I'll give you a link to download a set of pretty good security uh, clauses that I think are fair and pragmatic um, that can be sliced into this model shown. Um, so the main pitfalls of, um, that I see when implementing security controls into contracts is trying to dictate how a supplier should operate every security control. You don't need every supplier to implement your password policy. What you want for them to have is robust access controls and there are different ways to test that. So the other point I'd like to make about um, security contracts is that um, there's two, typically two parts of it or two types of security contracts to consider. One is a company level control, so your governance policy, privacy pieces, and the other is service specific controls. In my experience, it's more successful if you have a master services agreement with suppliers which have all of their company general controls in place and then put more specific security controls in their underlying uh, statement of work or their service based contract. But Having standard security clauses does not equal acceptance. And so, in fact, during this phase of your journey with your supplier, this is when you're um, first about to learn about how aligned you are in terms of security practices and who has the power. So some suppliers will have the power over you. Large tech companies, cloud platforms, they're typically going to have a standard set of clauses that are not able to be changed unless you have equal amount of revenue or equal size. In this instance, I recommend to um, know what you want in a security contract and what you expect from your suppliers and then compare their security clauses to, to what you need. Identify where they can't meet your requirements and manage that risk. And so the key things, having done this many, many times, the key, there's only three, there's key, three key things that I recommend to look out for in those big are large tech contracts. Uh, so one is the use of fourth parties. They're often well hidden. Um, secondly is where the geographic location of the data is going to be. Um, even in some of our more larger um, suppliers, they'll have a certain set of services which are located in the region where the data is located in the region you want. And then there'll be a couple of um, services down the bottom which you might not be aware of which they're putting in another country. I can see a few heads nodding. So some of you already found that. Well done. Um, sometimes it takes going through a myriad of contract clauses. Um, has anyone here experienced that where you're trying to find out how a supplier operates and you're just clicking from one contract to the next, to the next, to the next? I won't name names, but they are interesting contracts. Um, and additionally, what standard um, backups and encryption controls they are offering you? So they may have certain things they're offering, but there are some larger companies who if you really um, want these controls in place, you may have to pay additional for those um, encryption and backup controls. So by deciding your needs up front, you can measure your services against these. And when you have the buying power, when you're on the left here, um, you can set out what you want. But in my experience, large businesses can create significant barriers to market participation in these scenarios in particular when they push an extreme uh, amount of security requirements onto smaller businesses. And that's not to say the smaller businesses can't or aren't secure, um, but the larger companies often have, um, often more prescriptive in what they want and they can stick by their non-negotiables. The commercials for a small business to implement and um, you know, it's difficult and in many cases, the smaller companies just can't articulate what they've got in place, even if they've turned on all the security functions in their Azure platform or if in their one of their um, cloud-based services that they've built, they're still unable to articulate so they don't have the resources. So my tips for getting the most from your supplier contract negotiations is to know your supplier. Ask your supplier what type of security programs they have in place and open to, be open to negotiation. 
So I'll, I'll tell you a story about a case study I was involved in, well, a real life experience, as this has now turned into a case study. Uh, so I was working on behalf of a, uh, I'll call it a small bank. The small bank was both a client and a supplier to a large bank. So the large bank was going through a security uplift because of changing uh, regulation in Australia, which required a whole lot of work in the supply chain, um, contract negotiations and, and what, what was in place. And the large bank sent a very extensive um, list of requirements to the smaller bank. So I was working, um, representing the smaller bank. I said, after much heated debate um, and due diligence, we accepted these clauses. It was a big, very big contract. A year later, um, another engagement with the smaller bank, and we were doing the same thing. We were going out to all of the suppliers and we were uplifting those security controls. We developed very fair and pragmatic security clauses because um, we had experts working with us who, did, who understood the pain that you can create. And so we got down the list and here it was, the supplier, this big bank in the supply, uh, the, the big bank that had sent us this very detailed contract. So we thought to ourselves, well, maybe it'd be better just to send them back their own contract. So we made a few edits and we sent it back to them. It was not received in the same way. Mm -hmm. And so that just goes to show the power, um, the power dynamic and clearly showed that um, larger company, what larger companies can do to pressure smaller companies into complying with their needs but not be willing to participate in the same way. So let's say now you can implement a great security contract and you have the supplier on board. But how do you govern security over time? So hopefully this part of today's presentation will be a little bit more lively. We'll move away from security contracts a little bit. So that's where the security questionnaire had its origin. So now put your hand up in the room, anyone who has either sent a questionnaire or responded to a questionnaire. Yeah. I've never presented on this topic and not had at least 80% of the room. Usually it's 100%. <laughs> um, so you'll see, um, you know what I mean when I say there isn't just one way of asking questions and uh, there certainly isn't one repository of questions that people are picking from. In fact, most questionnaires are developed from a base of the writer's preferred standard and experience. And like all industries, ours come with many regulations, standards and frameworks. And while some questionnaires are aligned to a specific standard or framework, there are many which are custom made, hand-picked control questions. Um, everyone I've met who has ever written or owned a questionnaire definitely thinks it's the best. It's very well thought out, each different one. Um, and they're usually taken from various standards or frameworks. So here's a mapping of a range of requirements from a variety of regulations and standards modelled against InfoSec Assure's 16 practice areas. So this profile will change as we see more standards requiring a closer eye on things like software assurance or supply chain management. So the question I asked myself when I did this work is, does the volume of network security and content filtering type um, requirements clearly, um, which are clearly focused on by many standards. Does this drive questionnaire assurance content? Have the standards got it right in terms of what they're focusing on? Our analysis says no. In fact, we've helped companies respond to over 30,000 unique security questions over the past few years, and we've taken a sample of just under 7,000 of them. And here's what these industries seem to care the most about. Government questions tend to be weighted on physical security. Banks are most concerned with identity and access management and law firms on corporate governance, which makes sense, right? Are the technologies or risks different in these industries? Maybe, but consider that most of these industries are leveraging the same frameworks or at least standards, which replicate each other's requirements in most cases. So it's interesting to see how their due diligence questions as an industry tend to lean towards their own domain expertise. Now at InfoSec Assure, we don't consider any questionnaire to be the best, although we do consider some to be the worst. So here's some examples of things I've seen. Questionnaire sent to a client asking for bank um, to illustrate how they can present their security controls to bank A, but it actually came from bank B, so that was obviously copied. Um, request for copies of um, all the vulnerability scanning results for the last year. 
um, all the detailed reports to be sent over email, um, not accepting robust assurance that the company had already undertaken. I've seen deals, multi-million dollar deals held up because the person on, at the company who's requesting assurance for the deal to go ahead was very um, adamant that a SOC 2 Type 2 audit be undertaken or a 27,001 certification be done. While this company was already, uh, had an IRAP, IRAP assessment, which is one of the most complex assessments you can do in Australia against federal government's requirements. But they wanted, to, wanted it their way. Oh, and the formats, Word, Excel, multiple platforms. One of my clients, um, they had a breach and they were inundated with questions very quickly. Uh, and they got four and a half thousand within five weeks. And when we, we solved the problem for them and a few weeks later we looked at the analysis of the types of questions they were asked, how they conduct user access reviews in 104 different ways. Lang English language, it's an amazing thing. And how do you feel when you're the recipient of a security questionnaire? If you're a small business, it is extremely painful to try to answer 272, 990. The biggest one I've seen is 1,200 questions. Given you don't have a CISO, you don't even know what half the questions mean. Um, and if you do respond to them, you really don't get any feedback. It's a yes or a no. What happens at the other end? There's no real value. As a risk assessor, I've also assessed many responses and they vary depending on who answers the questions. So let's see if this sounds familiar to you. Let's say um, you ask a company this question or you ask this question, do you encrypt all the data we provide you? Well, sales would say, yes, of course we do. IT would say, yeah, I'm pretty sure, I'll just have to go and check. Our legal would say, yes, we encrypt it under, as per agreed under clause 54.3, clause A. Product would say, yes, and if we don't, we will. And IT security would say, well, what do you mean? Encryption at rest, in transit, at the hardware layer, at the record layer? You know, what, what are you talking about? We've been trying to get investment in this. This doesn't make any sense. The question doesn't make any sense. Does that sound familiar? Got a few people. So to bring this to life even more, let's have a look at some typical questions. So uh, I'll just give you a minute while you read through that. Is your network designed securely? Do you conduct user access reviews? These are real questions, yep. These are some of the better ones. <laughs> Do you have a support team? How is access control managed? How do you secure your assets? Do you have adequate surveillance in place? So reasonable, reasonable type of questions. Okay, great. So here's a response. So from the company in question. Um, thank you for asking. Our company has a robust security program and we take security very seriously. Our security program has a range of features and these include um, user access reviews are conducted annually and results are documented. We have a 24 by 7 support team. All equipment is appropriately labelled. A well-designed padlock and key function for additional highly secure working areas are in place. Electronic keypads control every access point to the building. Surveillance cameras are in place in every physical room. Now the contract, let's assume the contract was signed and all was going well until the supplier had a breach. So an on-site audit was conducted and we find that the controls were exactly as they described. So they had very well labeled equipment, they had a very well designed padlock approach, their cameras were in every physical room, they had a support team, they had electronic access um, keypads, you know, every access point, and the user access reviews were conducted and the results documented. Uh, but they did fail, most of them. There are a lot of um, harsh findings in those review process. So I'm not suggesting you should do a physical audit of suppliers, definitely not, or even extend the length of the questionnaires. If you were to really try and test this idea of how you can do an, a questionnaire to someone ask about surveillance cameras, um, you know, I, I, um, 
um, qualified to work for the Australian government, I do secret security reviews. If we really want to get down into how you would do that, you would say, do you have security cameras? Are they operating correctly? Are the screens broken? Are there, is there a power supply? Where are the recording going? The questionnaire list gets, gets in, intense and it's just not reasonable. You are not an auditor, you're a client of the supplier. So my point is that the answers people provide um, to a questionnaire are nothing but a self-assessment and there is a level of trust that you have to have with your supplier ensuring that what they said they're going to do they are in fact doing. But like all good awards, are they awards for brilliance or awards for the, uh, or, or do you get an award for um, writing a brilliant award submission? It's something in between. The completing the questionnaire shouldn't be a submission, it should be a fair and accurate assessment of a company's a posture. And as an industry, how do we find that fair and accurate assessment? How do we uncover that from our suppliers? If suppliers have been bombarded by questionnaires or feel like they will lose business, if they reveal any weaknesses, what happens when you send a questionnaire is there's a person in the supplier's company says, just get it done and don't lose the contract. Right. So if we keep answering questionnaires and then bundle them up in third party risk platforms and then start reselling them, we're just reselling marketing material. So we need to build trusted relationships with high risk suppliers and give them a chance to share their strengths and weaknesses and let us know um, or even suggest what they could do themselves to plug gaps in their control framework. When I ask or respond to questions as an experienced assessor, here are some tips if you haven't been involved in doing this. So when you're responding, make sure you clarify everything, um, use plain and complete language, be clear, be fair and accurate. Collect information needed for traceability. If you are responding and you're going to get someone like me as a risk assessor to assess it, we'd like to see evidence. Um, evidence of a control that's not operating well, but you're doing something about, you've got something in place and you've got a plan is better than getting a 100% score. I've talked to another number of other people who are risk assessors and we all do the same thing. If, we get, if you answer a questionnaire and you get 100%, we raise a red flag. Provide documents or extract the documents and redact them. Contents pages are, are not enough. Try to redact a bit more. And what to look for if you're actually getting a response. Is the response specific to the services you use? Do they use shared security controls uh, with other companies? Often um, we see where companies say, well, I'm not responsible for physical security because that's all. I, I put everything's in the cloud. If, you answer, if they're answering yes or no, does it satisfy your question? But most importantly, for those asking questions, give your suppliers the space and permission to call out what they don't do and be prepared to lean in or manage the risks. Will they put in place a plan to remediate it? This is a difficult call. If you're working in certain industries and your supplier has certain gaps, they do have to move out of the procurement process. But if we can help as larger companies, if we can help other companies, or even no matter what size company you are, if we can help each other, we are, in terms of this conference as well, stronger together. My question is to the industry is why do questionnaires at all? Why can't suppliers assess their controls and articulate how they secure their own business to their stakeholders and clients? By allowing suppliers to assess their own businesses, it allows them to upskill, get more value out of that own, own assessment and we create a more level playing field which gives all business access to more innovative solutions, better risk management and ultimately will be better. Uh, will better protect the economy and the nation. This is one of the problems my team works day in, day out trying to solve. How do we get all businesses to be able to have an internal locus of control over their security and proactively share their security attestations, reports, information with third parties instead of waiting for an unwieldy questionnaire to arrive on their desk. I hope I've given you some things to think about today as the problem with questionnaires is a big one. And as per the theme of this conference, we're stronger if we work together. Um, in summary, good, good um, cyber supply risk management is not just having a contract in place which has some security clauses in it. 
But as Mark Twain once said, if I had more time, I would have written less. And you can apply this to how um, you govern your suppliers. Take the time to consider what the key performance indicators are and which key controls you'll measure over time. I guarantee your list will not be every item in your contract and less is more approach. Um, less is more is the best approach, but no governance is completely wrong. Um, implement reasonable assurance. Uh, to apply what you've learned here today, um, use our model to get to know your suppliers, uh, create categories and risk ratings for each, identify your riskiest suppliers and investigate if the governance model is a two-way street where they can share their strengths and weaknesses with you. Download our sample clauses and check what coverage you have with the existing supplier base. If you'd like to know more uh, from us around the security questionnaire research we do, um, then um, you've got access to that there. Um, thanks for coming along today. I've got another 10 minutes. If you wish to contact me, my details are here. And I'd love to take questions or hear your war stories in the supplier assurance space. No, oh, thanks. <laughs> I know this is a recorded session, which is why I'm speaking to Drip. So if you do have questions, I'd like to share a story about the, a questionnaire you've received or a problem with the industry or anything that you've got, um, please don't mention company names. So there are two speakers here, the two microphones, I'm sorry. You can just walk to the microphone or let me know if you have a question, okay? So feel free, guys, don't be shy. Yeah, hey, I have a question. Yeah. Um, with regards to policies, like in our office, we're a federal agency, and you know, OMB mandates and all these other policies really come into play when we, you know, have to set up the structure, if you will, for CSCRIM and all this other stuff. So, do you have any uh, approaches on how you go and, and, and meet the mandates of various policies? Or are you talking technical policies or governance policies, like organizational policies? Uh, it's, it's more the bigger, like, federal policies is what I'm talking about. Meeting right. federal standards and, and that at a higher level. Like standards and frameworks? Is your question, should suppliers adhere to those? So I might be misunderstanding because I work in the Australian environment. So oh, federal, okay. po yeah, federal uh, policies are... You know I was going to ask that question first. Where, where are you located and all that? Yeah, so but federal policies, do you mean um, federal policies, like a set of standards that they're requiring organisations to adhere to, yeah? Yeah, so they're just standards, regulations, frameworks. We have the same thing in Australia, a highly regulated country. So do you have like a maturity model that you've built when you go out and you, you capture information, <laughs> the metrics and maturity model? That's a great question. Uh, we use the same 500 that you guys do. So, um, do you know, we have, so um, America, you've got like your NIST, FedRAMP 800 with your NIST cybersecurity framework as your more layman's um, um, CEO version. In Australia, we have something called the PSPF, which is the Protective Security Policy Framework, which is a set of 16 core. Underneath that, there is a document called the Information Security Manual. It's a 1,000 security controls. Some of them refer out to NIST. Some of them refer out to a few other things. Um, underneath that, they have the Essential 8, which is inside of the ISM. The Essential 8 is 96, 92 requirements. Very similar to NIST CSF, but it has a focus in terms of size, but it has a focus on Windows operating system. So the Australian government security team may have, ever, have done something else, said, well, this is where the risks are for smaller businesses, so the essential aid is all about that. We also adhere to 27001 quite frequently. Different industries will require that. SOC 2 type 2 assessments are becoming um, required in different sectors as they want more independence of audits. Um, what I find interesting about SOC 2 type 2 is I actually looked up how I could become an auditor and you need 15 years tax experience. Yeah. I find sort of ironic. Um, I think yeah. my question is related to similar what you said about SOC 2 Type 2. We're seeing a lot of like either vendors, suppliers, or the customers going around the questionnaires and just do SOC 2 Type 2. Hey, mm -hmm. can you send me SOC 2 Type 2? Or the vendors say, I'll send you SOC 2 Type 2 and be done with it, no questionnaires. Are you seeing that right now? Basically, kind of questionnaires going away and in some scenarios, and SOC 2 Type 2 is just kind of filling the hole automatically? No, I think that, um, well, you, know, you could say, well, a company should assess themselves against SOC 2 Type 2, or 
no, I'm not saying that a certificate or an independent audit should replace questionnaires because I think there are inherent issues with an independent audit and there's information that can't be shared through that process. So as a risk assessor, if I'm going to outsource a, a contract with you as a supplier and I'm going to share um, you know, per personal information or highly regulated data with you, I want more than an independent audit that doesn't show me any evidence. Typically, I want to ask a few specific security-related questions. I mean, SOC 2 Type 2 has a bunch of security, but it is security-related. But, um, yeah, no, I'm not suggesting it should be replaced. I think that I'm suggesting that each company should be able to do an assessment of themselves with a risk using a risk-based approach. They assess their controls, and they can use SOC 2 Type 2 requirements to do that, or NIST, or... 27,001 to assess their company, but they should be identifying their risks and also sharing where they don't do things. Let me add just one more question to you. Yep. Like the question over here is saying that Yeah, questionnaires are horrible. They're the worst things we've ever done. To, is that? Yeah, and that's what I'm wondering. Is that yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, people are really frustrated. Ask the same question over and over again. Even the bigger companies talk to the CISOs, they're like, I hate this, this is the worst thing we've ever done in the industry. Um, the other products, the other services that are, that are uh, starting to pop up are more like marketing engines. So here now promote your security like this to try and get assurance. Um, what I've done with InfoSec Assure and what I promote is that Companies should do an assessment of their controls. They're the same controls across all the standards, by the way. They're not really different. I mean, they're a bit different here and there, but they're the same. Assess your controls, understand your risks, and then decide who you're going to share that information with. So you do need to do an assessment. You shouldn't have to do multiple, and it's, my view is that you shouldn't be putting your security information in multiple third-party platforms which you haven't assessed. So. Is it realistic to think that a company is just going to admit when they have issues? And you, you say relying on the SOC 2 Type 2, the AICPA has five trust principles. Mm. And the only one that, they, that is required to be in a SOC 2 Type 2 is security. security yeah. And there's, five other, there's yeah. four others. Yeah. And if, you know, when it comes down to it, it's a statement of work. And if you're trying to hide something you can. and weaknesses, you know, they're going to do it. And because the yes, company, the auditor in the end, is going to do what he's getting paid for. Right. So, you know... You work for Fortune 500 companies, and you and you have PCI data, and you say you ask them, you know, do you have these? You have to have 90 days worth of uh, video, closed circuit video, in places where that's stored, and they say that yeah, we have cameras, but then you ask to see the video, and oh, well, we didn't say they worked, we just have them. Yeah, that's right. So I, I mean, so to say that the company is going to be, they, I think it's unrealistic to think in today's world that the company is going, that you can trust the company to be totally open and honest. Yes, I, this, is, this is the thing. I think this is the crux of this issue with security questionnaires. So if we continue to ask questionnaires the way we do the assurance, the way we do, what do we get? Just get it done and don't reveal too much. Make sure it's not contractually um, binding. Uh, make sure there's some disclosures on it. And we tend to, even with those independent audits, we tend to, you know, scope it to the right area so we can say the right thing. How can we move to a point where a supplier is, or any company is willing to share with the right parties, the things they have in place and the things they don't, and what risks that poses to them, and what they're willing to do about it, what they've got, what action plan. That's the thing. But and, and you have to have reasonable assurance. Reasonable assurance in place, that's right. You have to get reasonable assurance. How do you get someone? That is reasonable, isn't it? Reasonable assurance, well, oh, reasonable assur or a good outcome of reasonable assurance would be that a company would actually tell you, here's what we have, here's what we don't, and we know their risks. These are things we're not going to do. These are things we know we're missing, and these are the risks around it, and that's our profile. There Wait, is, is no that, way. And that's a unicorn view of it. It is, it is. But if we don't, well, if we don't start getting businesses to think that this is a an acceptable outcome to be sharing that information with their under non-disclosure in, in secure environments, then what do we get? We get an entire industry 
full of marketing brochures. Uh, hi, hi, I'm from Estonia, from a company hi. that uh, provides uh, electronic identity and uh, digital signature ecosystem. And we have also many uh, uh, suppliers. And uh, let's say this kind of work makes crazy uh, us and them. <laughs> And uh, my question is that how you think that it can be uh, 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 make more efficient? Still, I mean that those questionnaires don't really help anyone, I would say. That um, things, what, what we have done is, for instance, that, that okay, you have some kind of independent report, but beyond that, for instance, you ask really some specific controls and go and check also this, because as this colleague said that, that it's uh, um, in the questionnaire you can say anything but really those controls sh should be on spot you know the, the really solving something that is beyond this uh, independent uh, reports hmm. uh, for instance you have some kind of specific uh, requirement that, that or I don't know uh, data shall be retained some kind of data shall be retained hmm. not seven years but ten years uh, for a longer time and you go and check whether really those yeah. data beyond the, the, the seven years uh, were between before this 10 years uh, yeah. will be over data really are retained uh, mm. or something like that. I, I mean that we are figuring out also different strategies mm. to how to, to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a great idea. Look, and I do think that that's much more practical and pragmatic actually. Well, this is the supplier. This is the risk to our business. These are the security controls we should focus on. Let ask them ten questions, not a thousand. Um, so ask them the ten. In that same vein, let's imagine that that supplier and back to the previous gentleman's question around SOC two audits and things. They are useful in their place to provide that general governance. But what if that company knew what they were doing, which they should know what they're doing in terms of supply and service, and knew their risk and knew what controls are most important to their clients. They could still proactively provide, they, they should be able to say, well, actually, these are the key controls our clients are worried about, will be worried about because of the type of service. Hi, uh, Kevin Scribner. Um, a quick question, uh, I guess your perspective on you know, the number of vendors, uh, a number of them are here today um, that, you know, provide third-party monitoring services, right, and, and score your your vendors, your suppliers, and, you know, sell this pitch of, you yeah. know, we'll give them a grade. Um, you know, what, what are your thoughts on, on that and, and the value that, that that might bring? Look, I think all solutions are solving somewhat of a problem. Um, and if you ask me what's good about them, I could tell you something. If you ask me what's bad about them, I'll tell you something. I think with the um, scanning software, I think, um, I'll give you an example. I had one of my companies scanned by one of the best, like, third-party risk management tools, and I failed on a number of things. I was really annoyed because <laughs> I'm good at security, but I nailed everything. But I was failing on some scores around Microsoft, my um, DMARC settings, which couldn't be changed. So there was just some controls that I could not technically have. And I had no, if someone's scanning my environment externally, I was always going to fail on that. And so if you scan someone, um, you should give them the opportunity to explain if they're failing somewhere. Um, so, but I still think they're good because they're an indicator. And what we're doing with Assurance is we're trying to find the likelihood that the supplier is going to operate good controls. And the idea if you scan someone's external website and they have really crappy security settings on their website, does that mean that they've got a software solution they're selling that's really bad at security? Not necessarily. But maybe it's an indicator. But maybe their security team doesn't do anything with the website that's outsourced to a third party. So I think there is risk with taking, uh, doing external reviews of companies without giving them the opportunity to um, defend or explain. Um, does that make sense? Um, it does, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I'm in the same boat where our our score personally is not great, right? And and we say, hey, it, it's our external websites, and you know, but we want to leverage these tools to say, are you guys doing what you should be doing mm. when we have a bad score? So it's just it's, it's interesting. So. And is that somewhere? I mean, and this comes out to okay. So then, so if people are so if people are scanning your website and saying you're getting these bad scores, 
um, somewhere in the ether, um, are you going to turn around and reinvest your money and resources in fixing the website? Is that your highest security priority? Is that where you're most likely to be at risk of getting a data breach or having an actual technical attack on your company? Maybe not. Maybe a website's just a website yep. and there's nothing on it and it doesn't matter if someone hacked it and it went down. Okay. You know? awesome. So Thank I, you. That, that's that resource question, back to internal locus of control for companies instead of being driven by external forces. Hello. Hello. <clears throat> uh, actually do su supply chain, cyber supply chain risk management and we have questionnaires, lots of them actually. Um, I'm how, to. What's that? <laughs> Don't attack me, to. please. <laughs> um, <laughs> how willing have you found uh, in the suppliers you're with to form partnerships? Uh, we're looking into that because obviously these questionnaires are generic and, and they can answer yes and provide some minimal evidence, but how willing have you found suppliers are to like come to the table and say, look, exactly what you're saying. Hey, here's where it's bad, and we're not gonna be able to fix that. Mm. And we're, if you sign a contract with us, we're still not gonna be able to fix that. So you've gotta mitigate that for yourself because there's nothing we can do with our stack. Mm. Uh, have, have you seen that willingness from them to come to the table and admit, I, I just can't fix that. Yes, I've seen that. Okay. Um, in very, like in scenarios where the relationship's trusted, the control's been identified and they said, well, we're not going to invest in that. Um, in those cases, they, there has been some cases where deals have been um, cancelled because of it, like um, revenue's been cancelled or postponed until those controls can be put in place. And that's the risk the supplier takes by being open and honest. In, I think it's okay to talk about this, in one particular um, highly protected industry in Australia, the bigger companies have gotten together and said, let's all ask our suppliers the same questions and let's use one process because we've got a supply chain of 10,000 companies, so let's ask them all the same thing. And it took them like a year to agree on what those questions would be. And, um, but the outcomes are still the same. You send the questionnaire and they, as an industry, have decided that if certain companies who are providing to multiple bigger companies uh, fail, then if the contract's worth a certain amount, they will lean in. So let's say it's over 50 or over half a million. Those bigger companies will lead in and actually send a SWAT team out to the supplier's company and go, we're going to come and help you fix this. We're going to invest in you. I think that's fantastic. It still doesn't really solve the problem of if you're a smaller company and you can't have those controls, you can't invest in them, you do get thrown out of procurement. And I think that there's always a risk, but um, we're trying to find the truth in the industry, aren't we? We're trying to find what's really going on, and I think it's a big challenge to get to be truthful. So being wrapped up, if there's any more questions. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, you've got my details. Thanks, Thank Thanks. you very much. Guys, please sure to fill the surveys if you have not done that. So thank you very much. Thanks for coming.